We're going to talk today about how your work in open source can and should help you get a great job, advance in your job, grow throughout your career. This is my fourth time being here at DevConf. This is my vintage DevConf uh, scarf from 2016. So uh, really happy to be back here again. I've given a lot of different talks here at DevConf, usually on the community track, things like leadership, um, influence, stuff like that. But one thing I've noticed over and over again is the hallway conversations you have afterward. I meet so many people who are students or maybe work in a day job but not, don't get paid to work on open source. And they spend a lot of time and energy contributing to open source, but they do it because they care, because they're interested, and they're not necessarily getting much of a career benefit out of it. And sometimes it's hard for them to see the connection between the job they're applying for and the work they're doing. And that's a real shame because a lot of what you learn in open source development and open source projects is skills that are really needed in your day job. And so we're going to talk about how do you make that connection when you are talking to your manager or when you're talking to a hiring manager. How do you help them see that what you do in open source actually is giving you skills that are of interest to them? But first, a little bit about me. So almost two decades ago, I was a student in a university, much like this one. I had a lot of different interests, but I didn't really know for sure what I wanted to do for a career yet. Um, and so in the United States, university is a very expensive thing, and so your parents want you to figure out what you're going to do pretty quickly. And so I was taking some different courses trying to decide, and I remember taking an anthropology course, which is kind of the study of human cultures and how people come together, how they make connections, uh, shared history, shared meaning. And I went home and I said, oh, wow, Dad, this stuff is so interesting. Just, you know, what makes people work together cooperatively or go to war with each other? Um, you know, how do how cultures form? How are they sustained? And my dad said, well, you know, um, no one's going to pay you for that. So study that, but maybe, maybe the computers would be a better, better way to go. You like those two, and people will pay for that. Um, and so, you know, of course, like most parents, he was a little bit right and also a little bit wrong. Um, nobody was going to pay me for that back then. But um, technology ended up giving me a path into a career where that is actually now a lot of what I get paid to do, is to think about culture and what kind of culture does a company want to have? How do you sustain it? How do you help people work together within it when they don't get along? Um, so, started out as a web developer and ultimately I focus today on Red Hat's culture. That means a lot of things. I'm a people watcher, cat herder, um, conflict resolver, and reluctant dispenser of free and probably dubious and bad advice. So, you get what you pay for and money back guarantee today. And so I think that um, my story is actually a really good example of what I want to share with you today, which is that career growth is not a steady, straight, up and down ladder kind of climb. I think that's often how we think career growth happens. You look at someone who you know, has the job that you want or seems to do really well, and you think, well, they must have decided how to get from where I am to there and just, just done it. But actually, it's a lot more like rock climbing. Does anybody climb rocks in there? Yeah, a lot of you. So you know you kind of, from the ground, have a sense of maybe which way you're going to go up, but as you're climbing, you're really only seeing the next couple footholds, the next couple handholds. And so sometimes you go a little bit in one direction and you realize, oh, this isn't going to quite take me as far as I thought, so maybe I move a little bit down and then off in a different way. And that really is what career growth is like. You kind of move in the direction of what interests you, and you figure out, can I make more out of that? Or mm, maybe not, but you know, it was a helpful experience along the way. So as we think about that, um, one of the things that I love about Red Hat is you can email the entire company, all 15,000 people who work there. We have a mailing list called Memo List. goes out to everybody. And so as I was working on this talk, I said, you know, I have a couple ideas of what I want to do, but let me ask you know, a lot of other people who work here, what do you think? So I said, hey, Memo List, I'm going to give a talk at DevConf next week. Um, tell me how's open source helped your career. Send me a couple stories. Okay, thanks. Bye. And a few minutes later, I had 30 plus responses, really, really long emails full of stories. And I said, wow, you know, thanks everybody. This is, this is great. I'm all set. I've got what I need. And um, then they just kept sending me stories. <laughs> and so I said, no, seriously, this is, this is good. I've got enough. Um, 100 plus later, I had lots of really fantastic stories and had to kind of cut it off and write the talk. But huge shout out to everybody at Red Hat who sent me their stories. I think it really speaks a lot to the passion people have and how much open source does help people in their careers. 
I was really looking for what are the skills that you have in open source or you gain in open source that you might not be putting on your CV, you might not be talking about in a job interview. But people sent me all kinds of inspiring stories about how open source helped them in ways I didn't expect to. So I'm going to share a little bit of that with you before we dive into the practical stuff. So I got stories like this one from Alicia. She works in documentation for uh, Ansible. And she said, you know, contributing to documentation is actually one of the best ways early or midway in your career to really demonstrate skills and, to, and support open source projects at the same time. So even if you're brand new to a project, you can make a contribution. You often, as a newbie, can see gaps in the documentation that somebody who's more experienced can't see, right? They already know the undocumented stuff. And if you're more experienced, you can contribute more complex use cases. You can add details in that other people might not know. And really, anybody can fix a typo, right? So there's somewhere for anybody to start. It's a good way to kind of find your path in. And what she pointed out that I had never thought about was a documentation pull request can showcase a whole bunch of different kind of skills, and it's public, so it's something you can share. You know, if you're early in your career, you're trying to show I have a lot of ability, but you don't have much out there, you can show your writing skills, you can show your technical understanding, you can show familiarity with things like source control, right, editing tools, different platforms, all kinds of stuff. And I thought that was really interesting. She shared a lot about kind of how her path moved through that. Another really, really inspiring one from um, Adam Williams. Anybody know him from Fedora? Long time uh, Fedora guy. I've known Adam for years and I didn't know this about him, so I thought this is a fun one to share. Adam said, you know, the only jobs that he had before he started at Mandrake, Mandrivo, which is where he was before Red Hat, were paper delivery boy, library assistant, bookshop assistant, supermarket assistant, and administrative assistant. Kind of a theme developing there, perpetual assistant, right? Uh, Adam's degree is in history, it's what he studied in university. Doesn't have any formal training related to software development. In fact, didn't even learn to write code until about 2014, which I found shocking if you've ever seen the work that he does in Fedora. In fact, Adam started out as one of those people who just hangs around forums, helping people out. New users, trying to figure things out. And ultimately, he wound up doing that as a job for Mandriva. Then he developed into release management, then into QA for Mandriva, and then ultimately Red Hat where he is today. So really neat to see how you can kind of move in through open source, follow what interests you, and potentially build a pretty awesome career out of it. Felipe, he's a local here now. At the end of high school, he started contributing translations to GNOME. That's an easy way for many people to contribute who may not have a lot of technical knowledge yet. He didn't know how to code, but being able to see the code and look at it kind of grew on him. And so he decided he was going to study computer science when he went to university. Then he started contributing to, or the code that he contributed to GNOME actually helped him get an internship with Google Summer of Code. And I loved his story. He said that internship gave him the chance to travel abroad for the first time. It was the first time he ever flew on an airplane, uh, first time he ever spoke at a conference really life-changing experiences for him. And he said, you know, he didn't have those kind of expectations for himself growing up. It wasn't the kind of life he even imagined he could have someday. Four years ago, he moved across the ocean to Brunel and uh, wanted to really start a new life over here. He's still working on the GNOME and the desktop team at Red Hat. And for him, it's been a dream job that he owes all to free and open source software. So you can imagine just story after story like this pouring into my inbox. I was like, wow, this is Incredible, and um, there were so many more. I wanted, you know, I had to cut like six of them out of here so that we actually talk about what we came to talk about. But um, if you ever get a chance to talk to Seth Conlon, he or Kenlin, he has a really interesting story like this. And what I would encourage you to do is talk to some of your heroes in the community, talk to some of the people who you really admire, kind of what their career looks like, and ask them, how do you get started? How did you end up where you are? You might be really surprised to find out kind of how they got their path in. And so I wanted to ask in the room, because I know we have a lot of folks who have been contributing for a long time, what stories or examples would you add? How did you kind of find your way into open source? How's it helped you in your career? Everybody's avoiding eye contact. <laughs> All right, 9.30, too early. Fine, we'll go practical tips, but. All right, so kind of break it down, right? How do you actually do this? I think there are three basic steps, right? And every good presentation has three steps. So I think number one is get the experience. If you don't have the experience, there's not much you should be selling about the experience you don't have. So that's the easy one, start contributing. Most of you probably are already doing that. Then from there, it starts to get a little bit trickier. So how do you summarize that experience you have 
in a very succinct, meaningful way that other people can understand. So what does it look like on your job application, on your CV, um, when you're having a very brief conversation with somebody about a job? How do you talk about what it is you do in a way that they can see the connection to what they're looking for? And then the third thing is, how do you then illustrate that? When you have a chance to talk more about it, how do you bring it to life for people? What are the stories you share? What are the examples you share? What are the pull requests, maybe, that you share as examples of, of your work? Right, so pretty basic stuff, but it's kind of a one, two, three. So as I was asking Red Hatters, tell me about some of the skills that you've got in open source that maybe you didn't recognize you were getting along the way. Um, these are the kind of things to go back and look at your CV and say, like, does this stuff actually come through? Are there things that I've gotten really good at in open source that I don't actually have on my resume today? And often that is the case. We tend to jump straight to the technology, right? Like, here are the technology skills I have we don't necessarily move into what are some of the other skills that they might actually be looking for. And I'll tell you, one of the most interesting things to me is when you ask people what they're looking for in you know, a prospective employee, what am I looking to hire, they'll usually start with the technical stuff. And that's great, right? That's baseline. You have to have the technical skills. If you don't have those, the job's probably not going to work out for you. But if you look at the difference between somebody who really excels in a job and somebody who gets kind of stagnant and they can't really grow or even doesn't work out so well, it's not very often the technical skills that are the problem. It's can I work with this person? Does this person have the vision that I need to be able to you know, understand the bigger picture of what we're doing here? Can they communicate with others effectively? Does nobody want to work with them because they're really difficult, right? There's a lot of things like that. And that's the stuff that you don't usually get feedback about in a job. You just get stuck and you're not moving forward. Um, so that's where I think open source is a really, really interesting way of developing skills that people don't always put into words. So one that jumps out to me is, I kind of try to put, okay, how do you take skills that you have in open source and put them in words that somebody who's not an open source enthusiast would understand. So one of them is a global or cross-cultural perspective. Many, many companies today, no matter how small they are, I'm mean, talking like a couple hundred people, they're often distributed across different locations. And being able to understand that your way of thinking, your way of seeing the world, isn't necessarily the same as everybody else's, isn't necessarily the one right way of seeing things. Being able to communicate differently to different people matters a lot. So what that could look like on a resume is saying, look, I'm a team player who has experience working across different cultures, different groups, different time zones. You would be surprised how hard that is to find, and if you are a globally distributed team, it's really, really important. The second one is stakeholder management. So in open source land, what does it look like to manage expectations of different people? Right? Most of us, if we're contributing to a project, we all the time have people who have very strong opinions that conflict with each other. We have different opinions about what should happen from here. We have very strong, you know, this is the right answer. No, that's the right answer. And most of the time, the longer you work in a community, the better you get at having conversations with people who disagree with each other. Well, guess what? In your day job, that is often one of the most challenging things that people face in technical roles, but in any role, is I have people who have different opinions about what needs to happen here. Often there's not very clear lines of who's actually in charge. Or maybe one person's in charge, but another person can kind of subvert it if they don't like it. So being able to work cooperatively and talk to people about, OK, here's what you want, here's what I want, what are we actually going to do here, is a really valuable skill. And it's one of those things that I think comes to you over time in open source. You get better and better and better at this if you're in a pretty busy project. But you don't always think to talk about it in interviews. So thinking about, you know, if this is something that you're like, yes, I do this in my project all the time, and I've never had a conversation in a job interview about what that looks like, think about some of those stories, right? How would you share them? Third one that jumped out, lots and lots of people sent in, is being able to give feedback that is useful, that is respectful, that is helpful, that um, other people are open to hearing. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, being able to receive feedback in a way where you don't get upset, you're not defensive, you just consider it, right? Um, everything from code review type feedback to feedback about design, feedback about UI, right? Uh, being able to do that is surprisingly a difficult skill. And it's really, really something that gets in people's way as they're trying to progress in their career. So being able to share that this is a skill that you have and talk about examples of where you've done that goes a long way in an interview. 
So I thought, okay, how do you make this show up in just a couple words, right? So typical CV, what you might have in a little summary, the top of yours is something like, hey, I'm a Python engineer, one year of experience in designing and developing web apps. Great, that's awesome, it's a good summary. However, if you're a Python engineer who has a lot of experience in open source, and some other skills, you could look at what are they looking for in this job and what do I really want to highlight for that? So you want to kind of tailor your CV to fit the role. So let's say that you, right away you look at the job description, you look at the company and you see, okay, this is clearly a company where they work across multiple teams, they talk about, you're gonna to have to be able to you know, work with customers and work with ops, right? You're gonna to have to be able to do these kinds of things. I might say I'm a Python engineer with two plus years of experience because let's take some credit for what we do in open source here, right? If I've been contributing to open source since I was starting university, I probably have at least a year of experience if I spend a lot of time on that. So two plus years of experience working across different technologies, different teams, different time zones to develop web apps. All of a sudden I'm a little bit different from every other Python engineer with one year of experience who has their resume sitting in front of you. Or maybe, maybe I do a lot of work on OpenStack in my free time, but it's not necessarily connected to my day job. I could talk about, I'm a Python engineer and an OpenStack contributor who has two plus years of experience in web app development and code review, right? If I'm a maintainer, I'm probably taking a look at people's code. So think about what do you do in open source and in that side of your life, what do you do in your day job and what are the commonalities between them? And we'll talk about how to do this comfortably, right? You don't want to do this in a way where you feel like you're deceiving someone. You don't want to be dishonest about your experience, but you do deserve to take credit for what you're doing. So before I jump into other practical stuff, what other skills would you add? What are things that you see people develop in open source land that actually are really helpful in the stuff that they get paid for? So communication, how to write stuff. Say more about that. Um, to describe not just what you did, but maybe your motivation, so what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, so I'm going to repeat it back because I know we're recording. So what Tim said was being able to describe not just what you did, but what your motivations were behind it, what you're trying to accomplish, right? How does it fit into the bigger picture of what other people are trying to do? Um, you know, it's interesting, one of the things that came up was somebody said, you know, the difference often between a okay pull request and a great pull request is the little bit of explanation about what you're trying to achieve with it makes all the difference for the person who's reviewing it. It's a good example of where you develop a lot more communication skills inside what you do in open source than you might even in your day job, <coughs> unless your day job involves pull requests too. What other skills? Time management because of time zones. Say more about that. So sometimes when you go to like our day, it's a bit different than every day. Because we give you all the early morning meetings. So that's not basically the next night. Yeah, so go ahead. It's a skill that the skills are just a different time than they use and they get to be more productive. That's great. So I'll paraphrase for our mic here. Um, what he said was time management. Um, often when you're working across time zones, the flexibility to schedule things early in the day or late in the day to accommodate other regions um, really develops your ability to get things done in a compressed amount of time, right? Because if you're just adding on those meetings on top of the work that you're doing full time, you're probably going to burn out. Um, so learning how to adjust that. So I hand over here. Issue reporting and troubleshooting. Issue reporting and issue troubleshooting. So say more about that. Well, it, it really helps a lot if you see it. As a hiring manager, I, to see that the person knows how to file an issue, like put all the information, even maybe put a reproducer, uh, it also helps a lot to see that if the maintainer is dismissing how they argue about the issue, even if even more if they relate about the user experience, they are trying to to allow the other members of the community to have, and also like if you said them participate. On IRC, and somebody has a question, and there's no maintainer around, and they say, Hey, have you tried this? Have you tried these other things? So, those are very valuable skills, uh, both in interaction and in the technical side. Yeah, that's a great one. I'll try to summarize just in case the mic didn't pick it up. But um, it's talking about how you respond to issues, how you work with other people. And I think one of the things that um, you point out there too is that mm -hmm. for most projects, this stuff is kind of public record, right? So, not only can you say, hey, I'm pretty good at handling issues, I'm really good at 
routing people appropriately, kind of diagnosing what the problem is. We could say, and here's an example if you'd like to see where I did that um, or how I work in the community. So it really shows people you can demonstrate to a hiring manager, this is what I'm gonna be like to work with. And that's a really big thing, right? Because that's the biggest thing when you go to hire somebody, you just really don't know what are they gonna be like when they get here. How are they gonna interact with other people? Are they gonna be helpful? Are they gonna turn out to be kind of a jerk, right? You just don't know unless you can actually see some demonstrations. So you actually have a long history that you can point to where people can see how you behave. I saw another hand that went up and back. Yeah, so I like to add So say more about kind of how do you develop that in open source communities. Well, uh, for example, you can see ideas fully, but not necessarily a path to get to them. So by being able to see the overall picture and what you want it to, you can kind of model the right direction. Yeah, it's a really good example. I think um, one of the most underrated skills that people develop working in open source is the ability to deal with ambiguity and to navigate very complex system and figure out how do I make a case for something and move it forward. And you know, as much as companies can seem very much like a hierarchy where it's easy to figure that out, it isn't always, right? There's what's on paper, <laughs> there's what's officially stated, and then there's the reality. Have we all seen situations where you can see one person in a company who's really good at getting stuff done and other people who just get stuck even though they have really good ideas? Yeah. So that's something that um, working in open source often helps you come up with how do I detect kind of the path forward here? How do I work with people who have strong opinions and um, accomplish something? That's great. What other skills would you add in the back? Rebecca, I wanted to add that sometimes you just have to see the trend and work with it. And I think that's probably where I would add that organization. Yeah. Because just basically to where things are going and what you need to know about that. Yeah. I think, you know, that's a funny one, too, is that as much as working in open source kind of develops your confidence that you can make something happen and that you are empowered and can make a difference, it also sometimes can help reinforce for you, I may not love what we're doing here, but okay, I can go along with it because, you know, at the end of the day, I also care about what we're trying to achieve. And maybe I'll try to convince you to do something different, but I could just hop on the train and, and move it forward. What else? Yes, that's a great one. Really develops your ability to mentor others, to coach them, to do paired programming, code review, lots of things like that. Um, and I think as you become more senior, and you're, especially if you're a developer or engineer, that becomes more and more important to your role, being able to talk about that, being able to do that. Um, and it also becomes a skill that kind of sets you apart from other people who might be trying to get that same job. It's um, something that's important, but it doesn't necessarily come naturally to everybody. Anything else? All right, we covered quite a bit there. All right, so tips and tricks and a few mistakes to avoid. Uh, big one is don't assume that they know whatever. Don't assume that they know what your project is. Uh, don't assume that they know, you know what languages you code in because you work on this particular project. Don't assume they know anything. Just include when you're talking to somebody a very brief explanation. What the project is, what your contributions entail, right? They may not know what a maintainer is. They may not know what community management is. Don't assume they know. But keep it short, right? You want to be specific, but don't get down too far into the technical stuff. You kind of gauge these conversations, right? So give them just enough that if they know nothing, they get a little bit of it, and then you kind of want to read, okay? Are they like leaning in and asking me much more detailed technical questions? Okay, I know where I can go from there. Or do they look a little like, I'm not sure I understand. Okay, maybe I can take a step back and simplify a little bit. So start with the explanation you would give to your neighbor who doesn't work in technology and then build either toward more technical or even more simple as needed. Um, this is a big one though. I see this a lot. People will put um, on their CVs, they'll put, you know, maintainer for this open source project. But it, 
they are just kind of assuming that that's enough information for someone to understand, or they're thinking, well, if they don't know, they'll Google it. Well, if you're a hiring manager, you're not usually going to take the time to go Google something unless there's something else on there that got, got you interested to begin with. So don't make them do the work. Do a little bit of it for them, and you can build from there. The second one is really respect your contributions. This is something I see a lot. People tend to downplay what they do in open source if they're not getting paid to do it. So describe what you do just like you would any other valuable work-related skills or experience. So let's say you're in a job interview. This could look like saying something, you know, in my work on Anaconda, the Fedora installer, I review code for blah, blah, blah. I can say that and deliver that in the same exact way as I might say, in my work at Red Hat, I do blah, blah, blah. And if you present those things as equally important and valuable contributions, if you treat it as if this is work you do, because it is, the person you're talking to is much more likely to see it in that way. Um, I don't know if any of you saw there was a study that came out not too long ago in uh, Czech employers talking about whether they would count open source work as kind of work experience for students. And the answer was something like 80% said, no, 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 I wouldn't count that as real world experience. Well, a lot of that has to do with how you present it. If it's just in a footnote on your resume, right, next to I know how to use Microsoft Windows, <laughs> okay, that's probably not gonna get you very far. If you put it in the experience section of your, of your uh, CV along with your employment and you don't sort of differentiate it out, you can put it on them to ask the questions to understand it. You're just listing it as experience. So this is a big one too. Don't inflate your role, right? If you don't feel like I have this particular skill we've been talking about, don't put it on your CV because that's gonna lead to a very uncomfortable question in a job interview where you say like, I don't know, I just saw on a conference that I should say I had this skill. I don't really know what it means and I don't know if I actually have it. But do take full appropriate credit for the work that you've done. So this I think is much more common is that people downplay the work that they do or the skills that they have because they're afraid of appearing overly confident. So um, my friend at Red Hat, Sue Moynihan Cox, she calls, calls this learning the art of humble self-promotion, which is you need to be able to promote what you do, but in a way that isn't you know, in your face and ugly. The fourth one is really highlight related knowledge and skills that you have. So if open source has given you, for example, things people sent in, an appreciation for good documentation, a better understanding of testing, more understanding of how automation should work. Whatever it is, talk about that. Talk about how and why the work that you do in open source has contributed to that and why it makes you a more valuable employee. So for example, you might say, oh, I see that you're moving into CICD. I've actually made a couple of Ansible contributions lately. Would you like to hear more about that? Right, so there are ways that you can bring in your open source work into that conversation and really intrigue the employer to want to understand more about what you do. All right. So with that, I'm going to move us over to q and I'm not going to pretend I have all the answers to everybody's questions, but um, I imagine in the room somebody probably does. So what questions did everything we talk about today spark for you? A friend. How to start to be a contributor. How do you get started as a contributor? Yeah. Really good question. I think we have a room full of people who got started at some point who would like to uh, give some pointers there. So I'll, I'll repeat back for the mic. So good example is find a project you're already interested in, maybe something you're already using, something that relates to work you do already, and just start small, like some of the examples that we gave in here earlier, starting with documentation. Maybe my, my first thing might just be I found a typo in a doc. Great, that's easy. I can walk through, maybe I have to submit a pull request to fix it, so that gives me a chance to learn that if I've never done that before. Um, then over time, maybe I answer some help questions. Maybe then all of a sudden I come across, oh, it does it this way. I have an idea for how it could do it that way. Let me try to submit it. So you can let your contributions grow over time. And um, I think it's really neat, actually, how many of the stories that people sent in, that's exactly what their path in looked like. It was, you know, they didn't say, I'm going to be a Star Linux kernel engineer someday, right? They just started out with, oh, hey, I use this. Let me figure out how to make it a little better, figure out how to help other people who are getting started. Anybody have other tips I see up here? Yeah. Bug reports are really 
reason one. And usually it's not too hard to find one to report, so it's a great one. Becca. A little hard for me to hear up front, but I think I heard start with code review. Is that? Uh, gotcha. So before you submit your first patch with code in it, you might take a look at other people's code and start there. It's a great one. Anybody else have something they want to add? If you want to maintain this to log in, a good one is to go through the open box, maybe a bit oldish ones, and try to see if they still reproduce. If they don't, say so, if they reproduce and the steps were not clear to add that, and to help a bit the team try it, that, that's always good, and, and, and it gives you a better perspective into what the maintainers are dealing with, and, and it gives you then a path forward to simple requests about those and so on, because investigating it, maybe you will find that it's actually a few things. Yeah, so that's great. I'll repeat it back for our future watchers. Um, talked about if you want to win the love of maintainers everywhere, um, go ahead and take a look at older bugs that are out there and see if you can reproduce them, right? You can add comments about, yes, I was able to reproduce this, it is a problem, or no, actually on this version and my setup, it didn't happen. That starts to um, think about triage of bugs and things like that is a really good path in. Um, and I will say too, look for projects, if you really are like, mm, I don't, like, I want my first contribution to go well, I'm nervous, look for projects that have some documentation that's geared toward how to get started on the project. A really good project tends to have information about what's a great way to get started as a newcomer, what do you need to know, where do you go to do this stuff. If you want to jump into kind of a very busy and disorganized project, that might be a bigger hurdle, just figuring out how do I contribute. But many, many projects have taken the time to show themselves as newcomer friendly. And you can also identify yourself. This is the first time I've ever done this, right? That tends to make people a little more gentle with you. They, they understand you're, you're just getting started. That's a great one. What other questions do folks have or stories you want to share? So very good question is if you're applying for a company that's very much a proprietary company, as far as you know, they're not engaged in any open source projects, is it worth mentioning that you contribute? Well, I have an opinion, but what do other folks think? I would say absolutely. The skills you have, you acquire and use in open source, they translate almost one to one working in a, in a proprietary environment. Maybe not that uh, everything is out in the open, but if the, the company is big enough, there's still uh, a wide field of people you have to interact with, even if it's not visible outside. So you Yeah, so I'll repeat back for the, for the mic. The answer was a solid yes. This stuff is still going to be very relevant to them. And it's okay to ask questions about, you know, does your company contribute to open source? Are you familiar with it? You can kind of gauge where they're coming from, and then that will help you understand how much explanation do you have to provide. You know, well, this is what open source is. You never know. If you're talking to a recruiter, you might need to provide that. Um, if you are talking to somebody who's a hiring manager, maybe, maybe not. It would depend on kind of what their background is. And you know, it was interesting, one of the um, things that some folks sent in, ideas and whatnot, was they talked about, I can't remember who it was that sent it in. I probably credited him at the end, but if I didn't, sorry, Red Hatter, I'll go find out who you were. Um, but he talked about how having coded in proprietary systems for years and years and years and also done open source, that things that he worked on for 10, 15 years that were proprietary programs for an employer are no longer around. And he put a lot of his life into it, but he can't even see the code and sometimes can't even talk about the work that he did. Whereas even very small, and in his words, not so great code that he wrote for open source projects years ago, it actually still lives on 
you know, a decade or two later. And I think that's one area where open source is really a valuable thing to share with your employer because you can point them to look at code that you've developed. You know, if you're someone who writes code, you can show them, here's what my code looks like. You might not be able to do that, you know, if you're working in a, for a proprietary company, you may not have code to show, which, um, or that you have permission to show anyway. So I think that's an area too where you might even intrigue them if they're not engaged in open source already and they might be kind of interested to know, oh wow, I could actually look at your code and not just, you know, in a, in a here's a test kind of way, but in actual real code that's out there in the world. Over here. Yeah, that's really true. Um, what he said was that when you're showing you know, your code, you're not just showing your code. If it's open source, you're showing how you communicate, how you give feedback. And that kind of stuff, when you are looking at you know, prospective hires, you're trying to decide who should I hire, it's gonna give you a much clearer picture of what this candidate is versus somebody who just can tell you a little bit about, well, you know, I work for this other company and I work on stuff I can't talk about. <laughs> uh, what other questions do folks have thinking about what brought you in here in the first place, right? I probably want to work on my CV. I want to make sure I'm getting credit. What questions did this raise for you and not answer? To the front. What you didn't point out was if you go to conferences and if you give a talk, it's great to put that in your resume too. That's true. And often open source conferences give you a lot more chances to speak. Um, you know, just things like this. DevConf, I think, is one of the best conferences for if you've never done a technical talk. It's a really great one. It was my second or third talk I ever did anywhere was at DevConf, and I only ever had one heckler at any talk I've done in, in many, many years, so you learn how to handle that too, which is fun, but uh, it's really good, and, and many times if the talks are filmed or if you have the slides that you share afterward, you can also show people an example. You know, here's a talk I gave, and uh, here's the slides I used, and you know, that's one of those things that I think the longer you work in open source communities, the more you take for granted that you know, people just speak at conferences about what they do, but in a lot of companies, if it's a proprietary company, many of the people who work there don't ever get up and speak at a conference about what they work on. They might go to a conference and learn from other people. They might have to give presentations internally, but they may not actually have a lot of experience doing that. Whereas, you know, in front of a crowd full of strangers, if you can get up here and speak, you can definitely get up in front of, you know, your management team and talk about a feature you're working on. What other questions or stories people have? It's a Just to follow up comment on COVID, when I first came from proprietary roles to the open source world, I was very impressed with the amount of effort that we need to do the quality of COVID. In the proprietary world, you know, I had to rely on testing to be in the open source world, there wasn't as much resources for TV and there was no there wasn't as much equipment. And there was a, a great emphasis. That's a great comment, thank you. Was, um, for future watchers, he was talking about how the appreciation and skills that you get in open source for code review often really are you know, leaps and bounds ahead of what you might get working in a, in a proprietary environment and still very valuable skills that, that people benefit from, even in a automated world, testing world. Other questions? Back. Yeah, that's the, the age-old question, right? I've done so much, how much do I put on the CV? I don't want to be the one who shows up with a six-page CV alongside everybody else's that's two pages. So let me ask folks in the room, when you are thinking about what you put on your CV, how do you make that decision? What makes it on, what doesn't? Over here.
Yeah, so summarize what you do and highlight a couple examples on there. And you can always give a hint on the CV that there's much more you can talk about. Um, what I would do is take a look at the job you're applying for and try to decide out of all the stuff I've done and all the contributions I've made, what might be most relevant and most interesting to this particular employer. Um, it takes effort to do that, right? It's a lot of work if you're applying to three different jobs at once to kind of tailor what it looks like but it really will make your CV stand out from all the others because it's clear you're interested in the role and you've learned a lot about it. You can also ask questions of the hiring manager. So in the interview, ask some questions to understand a lot more about the company, about the job, and that will give you the opportunity to share specific examples that you might not have put on your CV. I saw a hand go up. I saw three hands go up. We'll go here, there, there, go. Excellent, so you can also link to your GitHub. Really good point. Yeah, so that's a really good litmus test too. You know, if I'm the employer and I'm looking for at CVs, what are the things that I would want to read on here? And what are the stuff that I'd be like, okay, that's nice. That's the stuff that you leave off and stuff you put on. Go ahead. Uh, I would encourage you uh, not to focus only on the technical, which are, which are the PR or the uh, comments that you've made that are most technical and impressive, but also with the ones that you actually had to, uh, to fight through, like the ones that you had uh, some intent discussion or the ones that ended up with you having to throw it away and make a different approach because this shows much more growth as an engineer. Like otherwise, like if it's just technical stuff, you could be uh, a new if you want to, if you're trying to find some more advanced position, definitely you have to the other part. Yeah, so that's a really good point. Um, I'll just echo back very shortly. Um, don't just put the really technically interesting stuff on there. Put the stuff that you had to think a lot about, maybe the stuff you've worked hard at but decided, oh, ultimately this isn't the right answer. I had to go in a different direction. Really, really good points. Um, and I would also say, too, if you are applying for a job in like engineering, in customer-focused organization, what are the ones that you've worked on that made a big difference for the person using the software, for the end user? Those sometimes are not the most technically interesting things, but often are things that show a perspective that maybe not every other person applying for that role would have. So talking about the impact of what this contribution was, what was the difference that it made to the project, to the user, that can be a really good thing to highlight too. What else, other questions and stories do folks have? So I think one of the most valuable things you can do before you go in for a job interview is to spend some time practicing like you're going in for a job interview, right? So you can recruit your mother, you can recruit your boyfriend, you can recruit someone who is willing, loves you and is willing to sit in a chair and ask you tough questions. Um, but take the time to anticipate what kinds of questions might I be asked and practice answering them because one of the most simple things that people fail to do is actually to prepare for that conversation. If you want to be able to share stories and examples, it's really hard when you're nervous and you're sitting in a chair to come up with those. You're like, I know I have one, but where is it? But if you've told that story a few times over, if you know in your head, here's the couple of skills I really wanna make sure come through, then that's a really valuable way. If you've told them a few times in practice, you're gonna be able to tell it much more easily in the moment. And another thing, too, is to remember that anytime you're in a job interview, it is an interview of each other. It's not just them deciding, am I good enough to hire? You want to know, do I actually want to work in this place? And so really taking the time to ask questions about what is the team dynamic like? What kind of work would I be doing? I ask really tough questions when I interview for a job. So I will ask questions like, okay, let's say six months from now, I am wildly happy with this job. You are really happy with the work I'm doing. Why is that the case? What made the difference between me and somebody else in this role? Okay, let's say six months from now, I'm really unhappy here. Why do you think that would be? Right, you can start to uncover if there's sort of a toxic environment that I wanna know what I'm walking into. And you can tell by how people answer and what they don't say, right? If they're just very like, oh no, no, you're gonna love it, you're gonna love it. Maybe, maybe not, <laughs> I don't know. If you're not willing to talk about what are some of the challenges, that's actually probably a tip off that this might not be where I where I wanna go. It might be a place where they're not very comfortable talking about things like that. And asking that question of them too. Let's say six months from now, 
you know, I've got the technical side of my job down, but you're still not real happy with the work I'm doing, what would be the most likely reason? You know, a year from now, if I felt stuck in this role, I wasn't advancing, why do you think that would be? It'll make them a little uncomfortable that you ask those questions, but it actually will kind of get them to open up and it'll give you a chance to relax in there, listen, gather information, and think about, okay, what examples might I want to share that I didn't think of before? It'll help you understand what are the challenges that they're facing, what has been tough for them about, you know, often they're filling a role that they've filled before. So, you know, somebody who wasn't successful in it, why was that the case? Really, really good stuff. And also it helps kind of humanize you and the person who you're talking to. So you actually get to know each other as people, which in the end makes you more likely to get the job. Even if you weren't at the top of the list going into it, having those kinds of conversations with someone often actually will move you up. On there. They remember you, they remember that you listened, and um, it's a good thing. What other questions people have? In the front. Yeah, that's a good question. So you could ask the interviewer, have you ever contributed to an open source project? Kind of what's been your history with it? And you might be surprised, um, especially if it's somebody who is older that's interviewing you. Many times they did years back and they haven't in a long time. Or they might say, you know, I've never contributed, but I used Linux when I was in university. And you know, that was, I got really interested in that. I forgot about it until you mentioned it. Um, it's kind of, it's really surprising how ubiquitous I think open source is now and how many people are involved in stuff. Um, it's a really good one. You can also ask them questions about kind of their career journey in the company. So you could say, like, tell me about how did you start out here? How long have you been here? You know, what's been the most, what's your favorite thing about working here? What's the biggest challenge you have about working here? The bigger picture that you can get of what this role is like, the more you take this emphasis of the interview away from, you know, do you have what it takes to cut it here? And it's more of a conversation of, are we going to kind of make each other happy? Are we going to be able to give each other what we need here? Whether it's, anybody have stories they want to share about um, kind of how they got started in open source and what that's done for them? Go here. Sure, Say it real loud. Okay, I heard, I heard, I heard Go ahead. I mean, I also want to believe my mom to this. I mean, I, I, there was a program that was one of my favorite ones that was called Spot. And I tried to put it in my say so. I mean, it's something you can show. You may not, you might not position it as here's an example of an open source contribution I made, but it might be here's an example of some work I've done. It started out as, you know, an open source project and I was, I couldn't get what I wanted in that project. It didn't meet the needs that they had, but I was able to fork it because it's open source and I took it in a new direction and here's what it does now. I think it'd be an interesting thing for people to see. Go in the front. I, I personally always have Yeah, so it's um, definitely how it's received might depend on who the interviewer is, but certainly if it's somebody who works in open source, they'd be interested to, to see that. I think it's interesting that um, one shift that I think kind of many open source communities have made, it used to be that forking a project was kind of seen as like not a good thing so much. It was, you know, we want to kind of keep one central thing, but now I feel like it's just a much more like, yeah, if, it's, if it doesn't meet the objectives that um, this project has, why not? That's why it's open source, so we can do new things with it. One project can't meet everybody's needs, but you know, a different project can meet a whole different set of needs. It's a good one. Other questions, comments? All right, well, I'm going to go to my acknowledgement slide. I mentioned there were 100 plus emails that came in. Ideas in particular that I took from Red Hatters. This is who contributed a lot of them. And there were many ideas that came in from five or six different people, too. So. Uh, kind of proof, I think, that a lot of this stuff really people find it to be helpful to them and that our experiences working in open source actually are sometimes more universal than we would think. So thank you, everybody. I'll be around if you want to chat afterwards. Really appreciate you coming out.